God will use suffering and difficulties and the most awful challenges you face to bring himself glory. And now I look back and it's the entire platform and my passion in medicine and what I do now with functional medicine in finding root cause and being a medical detective for people. It comes from that day sitting in the car where God said, no, Jill, I'm use this. <laughs> and, and he did, he used it so greatly. Hello again, my favorite community of caregivers and those who are going through struggles and trials. Today's interview is going to be a little bit different than those that I've had in the past because we are going to talk about health and healing, not only just in our souls, but in our physical bodies. I have with me Dr. Jill Carnahan. She is a functional medicine expert. She works as a fun functional medicine physician to help patients find the root causes of their illness and to identify nutritional and biochemical imbalances that may contribute to the symptoms. Dr. Jill searches for underlying triggers that contribute to illnesses through cutting edge lab testing, as well as nutrition, supplements, lifestyle changes, and things that will help treat illnesses at the root. Dr. Jill, thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. I'm super excited to be here with you. One of the things I do want to mention as we are recording is that Dr. Jill is not here to diagnose or in any way to treat you individually. We recommend that you pursue that through your own practitioner. But Dr. Jill is here to talk into the struggles that we have in medicine today and the struggles that we face when we hear the word incurable, which as a matter of fact, I loved in your book, Dr. Jill, you said incurable does not mean there isn't an answer. It just means there isn't a pill that we know of that will cure something. You have an amazing history. So why don't we start with that? Just tell us your background, how you even got into this. Yeah, thank you so much. So, you know, it's interesting how God uses our pathways and uses our suffering to teach us these great lessons, because I had no idea. I grew up on a farm in Illinois. I'm one of five children, you know, typical, um, amazing Christian parents, amazing upbringing, hardworking family. And um, I knew I was a little different in the fact that I was born with severe allergies and asthma and issues with um, more allergies than asthma, but issues with um, sensitivity to my environment. And um, I remember being having difficulty working in the fields like my brothers. So I was inside and it probably started my love for learning and books because that was a safe place for me to put my efforts and energy. Um, but nothing really was massively out of place except the allergies and stuff until I got into medical school in my 20s. And and my third year in medical school at the age of 25, I found a lump in my left breast. Mm -hmm. And even then, I didn't think a whole lot of it because we were taught, you know, young women don't get breast cancer. But as the story goes, was shortly after that, I had a biopsy and found out, got a call from the oncologist within a few days of my surgery. And she said, Jill, I, I don't even know how to tell you this, but you have aggressive breast cancer at 25. I at literally 25. 25, literally days after my birthday was my biopsy. So I was like just barely 25. In fact, I found the lump when I was 24 and within a week or two of my birthday, then had the, um, the biopsy. So obviously it was a shock. And at that time, I, I remember just being, you know, kind of dumbfounded and um for her right away that it was cancer i needed to be very aggressive in the treatment and you know god right away though gave me like he always does something so beautiful i was listening to a sermon on the radio within weeks of being diagnosed and i didn't know now i'm thriving i'm 20 some years later um and doing well and i overcame that but when i was in the midst of that diagnosis i didn't know if i had six weeks or six mm -hmm. months or six years i didn't know and it could have gone any direction. It was definitely a life-threatening diagnosis. I always say, because this uh, makes it relevant, I was in a group of young women in my area near Chicago, um, under 40, that had breast cancer. And I'm literally the only one who's still living. So that shows you how aggressive a disease it still was, it was and still is in young women. But God gave me this verse from this sermon. And I remember just being like shot to the heart. You know, when God speaks to you and you're like, you're like frozen. Um, and it was from John and it was um, the sickness. It was after Lazarus dies. And mm -hmm. Jesus says, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God might be glorified thereby. And it still touches me because I remember sitting in the car and just being instantaneously knowing Number one, I knew God would help me to live somehow, some way. And number two, I realized so deeply my whole life's journey is about this. And it's 
God will use suffering and difficulties and the most awful challenges you face to bring himself glory. And now I look back and it's the entire platform and my passion in medicine and what I do now with functional medicine in finding root cause and being a medical detective for people. It comes from that day sitting in the car where God said, no, Jill, um, use this. <laughs> and, and he did. He used it so greatly. Well, it, and it didn't end there. Your suffering continued because you went through the entire breast cancer and then more happened. Yeah, so I got through uh, radiation chemotherapy, and they took everything they could and, and threw it at the cancer. So I had three drug, very aggressive chemotherapy, lost all my hair, lost all my weight, all my muscle, was incredibly sick from the chemo, had radiation as much as I could possibly give without hurting my heart, and multiple surgeries to get clear margins. So I had pretty much everything you could imagine. And so I it came out of that nine months later, full through the treatment, they considered me in remission at that time, not knowing if it would come back or not. And I was sick and tired and bald because I had no hair from the chemo, but I was okay. And I went back to medical school within a month or so. And I was still really, really malnourished and, and bald and sick. I started having fevers and I started having abdominal pain. And I thought, oh, this is just from the chemo. I'm just weak. And we were taught on the farm not to complain, to work hard. And so I didn't really even know how to express the fact that I needed rest and I needed to take care of myself. It's a whole nother lesson. But within six months of finishing the chemotherapy, I was again in the hospital and the surgeon told me, Jill, you have Crohn's disease. I developed an abscess in my gut. And when he did the surgery to repair the abscess, um, he said, this is Crohn's disease. Now, Crohn's, for your listeners, if they don't know, it's an autoimmune disease where the body starts to attack the gut lining. It's also life-threatening. And at that time, it was considered completely incurable. You're, he said, you're going to have this lifelong. You're going to need immune-modulating drugs. You may have most of your colon removed over your lifetime. And he said multiple times, it's incurable. And I do remember thinking, you know what? there has to be something I could do. And I asked him about diet, my gastroenterologist. And he said, Jill, diet has nothing to do with this. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that was another turning point. I was like, that can't be true. And I kind of set out to prove him wrong. And I found out several weeks after I knew uh, some diet changes. I took out gluten and inflammatory foods. And within two weeks of changing my diet, my Crohn's symptoms had gone away. I wasn't cured. It took years to cure myself. But now I consider myself completely cured from Crohn's and from breast cancer. So one of the reasons, Jill, that I wanted to speak with you, and I think our audience is going to so appreciate this, is because this last year with my son, he, we hit a wall. He already was diagnosed with a lot of disabilities and challenges, but at 24, he regressed so significantly that we were in emergency rooms that told us he's too complicated. We don't know how to treat him. His tremors were off the chart. He was having grand mal seizures. He fell and fractured his back three times in all three levels. Mm -hmm. Um and we were like, he was doing so well, but now he's regressed to the point of, as they put it, psychosis or severe confusion, throwing a ton of medication at him. And then as I started to pursue, because I had to get to the root, yeah. what is the cause of this? And we we saw a physician or a functional medicine doctor who did all the testing and said, oh, well, he does have SIBO. He does have herpes simplex one. He does have parasites, mycotoxins, severe environmental and plastic allergies. He also has um, early onset kidney disease and liver dysfunction due to five genetic mutations. So many of us have no idea that there are alternatives to healing. They just wanted to send us home. And I'm not saying there isn't a place for for medicine as we know it in America. Yeah. I've had two back surgeries and a ton of other things that were essential. However, this functional getting to the root cause, it's like pulling the weeds versus mowing the lawn. That's how I've explained it to people. We stopped mowing the lawn. We had to get to the weeds or he was going to die. So teach us some more about functional medicine. What does that look like today? I love that. And what I'm first of all, I'm sorry you had to go through that, but what a great analogy and a testimony to the power of getting to the root cause. So I'm trained. This is what I love because I went, it's funny too, this is part of the God story. I, I have the heart of a naturopath or someone who's a much more natural healer. And I knew that, I mean, we grow organic food on the farm. My mother was a nurse, but we wouldn't go to the doctor first line. We'd first maybe try some herbs or tea or tea. So I grew up with that. But what happened is as I looked at schooling and wanted to kind of say, God, where do you want me? I was really feeling called 
called to a traditional medical doctor degree. And the reason for that is um, it's still the most reimbursed system. And if you have a heart attack or a car accident or some trauma or some acute illness or a bacterial infection where you're septic, it's still the best acute um, uh, involvement to heal a system when it's broken in that state. But what we don't do very well is chronic illness or complex illness. So things like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, or what you mentioned, which is my area of expertise, environmental toxicity, mold-related illness, tick-borne infections, viral infections. So I would say functional medicine at the core can be um, boiled down to two kind of triggers. One is environmental toxic load, and that can be heavy metals or mold, um, mycotoxins or mold in a home mm -hmm. or workplace or other chemicals, which we're all swimming in toxic soup with the parabens and phthalates and things. Yes. Or on this side, it's infectious burden. So toxic load, infectious burden and infections. We all have had chicken pox and most of us have had Epstein-Barr and many of us have had uh, cold sore virus, the HSV that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, we many of us have exposures and things and many of us have been bit by spiders or ticks or mm -hmm. um, mosquitoes and other viruses and other tick-borne uh, infections like Borrelia or Bartonella or Babesia. So these are in our systems and they, if we have a robust immune system and we're strong and resilient, they are there and the immune system keeps them in check and they're not really causing problems. I always say Lyme disease is real common, but if we went out and tested, you know, 10,000 people on the street who had no symptoms, were working and doing life fine, we might find 40, 50% of them test positive for Lyme. So why are some people having symptoms and some people not? That's this toxic load in the immune system. And as the immune system becomes weak from the burden of either um, inflammation or, or a toxic load, all of a sudden these old infections that weren't really bothering us start to pop up. So when I look at a patient, I'm kind of looking at those two bundles and those two bundles can also create immune deficiency, immune um, activation, like an autoimmunity. So either too high or too low, and they can also create massive amounts of inflammation. We actually saw this and talked about it so much during COVID because the people who really did poorly, it wasn't the virus. It was the virus triggering your own immune system to create a massive inflammatory storm. And that's what actually caused death in people, not just the virus. And this is so relevant to your son's story, to so many of your listeners to my own story, because as we look at these underlying things, so for example, in medicine, we're taught to give a label. So like multiple sclerosis, here's a label, or maybe schizophrenia psychosis, or maybe insomnia. And all these are is a label that describes what set of symptoms that patient has, but it almost never describes the why, like why did someone get, like, for example, I say diabetes doesn't happen one day. It's not like Tuesday, you're not diabetic and Wednesday you become diabetic. So we're all walking on a trajectory towards or away from disease in some way. And when we find ourselves on that pathway, we we can look backwards and say, what things in my past um, exposures, triggers, uh, family history, genetics led me to this point today, like they did with your son. And that's really functional medicine is being a detective to go deeper and say, not just what's the label, but why did this come about? Absolutely. So Jonathan was born with an immune system dysfunction. He was mm -hmm. on antibiotics for years. I know by the age of 10, you mentioned in your book, um, yeah. unexpected, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to to pursue that, all of you who are watching or listening. Um, but you were on 10 different antibiotics, or you were on antibiotics 10 different times by the age of 10. He was on antibiotics for most of his early life. And now we know, looking back, the leaky gut and the things that happen which suppress the immune system. How do people, how do you inform people to look at and to be a detective and not just accept a diagnosis from a doctor and say, well, I need to take all this medication. Uh, love that question. And I want to empower your listeners because someone like me, I listen carefully, but the patient tells me everything I need to know. So if you're out there and you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't have a functional doctor yet. Literally, one thing you could do is write down a timeline. It's kind of like a journal or a time. And you literally put from birth till today. And on the timeline, you talk about, oh, I had a massive uh, a pneumonia. I was hospitalized for 10 days a year, or I had a seizure. No one knew what happened. Or I had, I remember going to um, East Timor and I got a horrible gastrointestinal bug, like I got uh, food poisoning. And so I'll ask people travel history, history of illness, history of their uh, workplace, their living environment. Did they have any jobs that required like chemical exposures, like a photographer that actually develops film or a welder or a person who works with blown glass? Those are all things that have different exposures. So you can, as a patient, empower yourself and just write a timeline. Because when I'm listening to a patient's story, in my mind, that's all I'm doing is putting together the timeline of what happened when. 
one of the things with mold that's very interesting is often people will move to a new house and every since we moved to this new location, I've been sick or my son's been sick or two of us have been sick. And you can have a household where just one or two people are affected because there's a genetic component of that too. So I would suggest a timeline of writing down kind of significant events in your life and maybe when the last time you felt really good was because that's often a transition of something changing. So you have in your book, which I love, the um, test, the blood test that people need mm-hmm. to have. Everyone should have these by the age of 30. And then you list them out. And on one of the podcasts that you were talking about, there is one organization you mentioned that will cover, insurance will cover these kinds of tests. So what can people ask for to look for heavy metal toxicity, environmental mm-hmm. toxins, uh, any kind of um, yes. any kind of limes? like? Like we were in the hospital and the physician yeah. looked at me and said, no, he doesn't have Lyme. I said, look at his IgG marker. He yes. does. There's yes. one marker. I know it's very hard to find. Yes. But I was so determined to find what was wrong, but it was dismissed. So yes. where do people go to have these kinds of tests run for themselves or their loved ones? Yeah. So I love that you mentioned that because in the book, I specifically put um, almost everything on that list is something you could get at your local hospital, LabCorp Quest, any, I don't have any affiliation with anybody, any major regular lab. It doesn't have to be because we in functional medicine also do, we send out stool tests. We send out urine tests. We do a ton of specialty. We do a Cunningham panel, which is for autoimmune encephalitis, which is brain inflammation from infection. That's yeah, what I thought he had. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we do one of my favorite for Lyme, the really good test that's out there is called Igenix. And it does a lot more detailed look. And we almost always get more accurate results because they do more, more than one strain. So for example, say your local hospital does one Connecticut straight up strain of Lyme disease. If you didn't get bit by a Connecticut tick, you might have a different strain and it would show up and it would look negative. But back to what do you ask your doctor for? So in the book, there's that list in that sidebar. And you can literally get almost every single thing on that list from a regular lab by a regular MD. And now it's a whole nother story if they'll order it for you, but these are not difficult tests to order. Um, And then as far as coverage, um, if you use symptom codes, like say someone has memory loss or fatigue or um, abdominal pain or they're weak and tired, or you can use, that's what I'll do is I'll ask symptom wise and use codes that cover these kinds of things. Sometimes things aren't covered, but I also want to say, if you are just a consumer, you maybe don't have a doctor, there are a lot of labs out there that are called, it's called direct to consumer, which what it means is nowadays, like someone like LabCorp or your hospital lab, they you, there's a, a place where you can go and actually pay cash and get a discounted price and you can order them yourself without a doctor. So it's good and it's bad because I hate to say, to tell that to patients then you have this information, don't, don't know what to do with. You still would want to have a doctor help you figure it out. I don't want to scare anyone, but you can now order labs yourself. It's called direct to consumer labs. This is not the brand name. It's like you go look for an, a lab that's direct to consumer. And I'll tell you a secret, the way they charge insurance is about 10 times what the consumer actually pays. So for example, if I'd order a lab, a big panel for patients, it might be $2,000 bill insurance, but the actual patient cost is more like 200 or the negotiated rate. So often these direct to consumer labs are about a 10th of the cost that it would be if you went through insurance. So you can either do either way, you can pay cash and pay cheaper, or you can go through insurance and get a discount, but you don't have to use insurance and you can still get quite a bit done. So when I went to my, to his primary care physician, I had also gone to a functional doctor and he had given me a whole list of things to ask for as well. And my physician who I love, he's wonderful, said, I haven't even heard of a lot of these. Mm -hmm. My longing is for the, for the Western and functional medicine organizations to marry and Mm -hmm. to cooperate. How can we encourage our, um, our advocates, our patients, our, those who are caring for loved ones to communicate well with the doctors? So it's not a sense of intimidation, but it's Mm -hmm. simply I'm longing for my loved one to be well, and I'm longing to be well. If it's, I've been told I have chronic fatigue or whatever it may be. Um, How does that communication process go? Oh, I love this question. I love everything about this interview because it's it, my passion literally is mm-hmm. I love my patients. I see my patients, but I can only one-on-one see them. And that's limited to my time and energy, right? Of how many people I can see per week. 
one of my passions is educating physicians and not just, and one thing, again, God allowed this because he God allowed me to go to conventional medical school. So I have a medical degree. I have credentials. I have kind of in, in a medical realm, I can be respected by colleagues who maybe don't understand functional medicine. And so one of my passions is being able to teach and educate. And even through this book, I hope that many physicians will read it and be at least intrigued by what else is possible because most of us, I'd say 90% of docs that I know, um, went in to help and heal people. Mm -hmm. And then we got stuck in med school and the bureaucracy of prior authorizations and your insurance. And all of a sudden it becomes overwhelming. And so most of the time, if you're talking to your doctor and they blow you off or they kind of don't really take you seriously, it's not because they genuinely don't care. It's because they're overwhelmed and they yeah. get, they're given seven minutes, maybe 10 minutes if they're lucky to talk to you. And you can't do what I do in 10 minutes. You just can't because you have to listen. I spend 90 minutes minimum with a patient to get the story. Yeah. So you need time. So they're probably an overwhelmed um, lack of time and frustrated and they really in their heart maybe want to help. So one thing you do is do your research and bring in, I would love to have this and, and ask for it. But I will say this, if, if your doctor really blows you off or really treats you poorly, there's something called medical gaslighting where you almost are made to feel like it's all in your head. And I always say, I, I may, I mean, there are some things in our head. We have trauma things too, right? But I never assume that it's in someone's head. And I always look for real root cause. And so if you have a doctor who really is um, demeaning your concerns, you probably want to find somebody else. And you can find now conventional docs that are open-minded. Um, I always think the younger ones are sometimes better than the, the older ones, but not always. And, um, you know, so you can find that. Uh, but I would just open that conversation and do your research. And like I said, sometimes you can do a lot on your own and then uh, get someone to help you. Because one of the doctors, uh, if they don't know about these tests, they feel um, maybe a little bit overwhelmed by it themselves. Mm -hmm. So the more you can bring them, the better. So I do have four notebooks that are three inches thick. And it goes from his birth to current and his Great Plains lab, vibrant lab reports yes. were 100 pages. And of course, we need a we need help in having someone break that down for us if we don't have a medical degree. But I really, really have become more educated on these are things that happen in our bodies. Yeah. And trauma can often be the root, or it can be a signal that gets triggered for my son. We went through a trauma intensive, and that seems to have triggered the compromises all the way around. How does trauma play into this? Oh, like I said, I love this interview so much because you're speaking to some of the core things. So I'll just tell you briefly a little bit more of my story because it relates to the trauma. So I had Crohn's and cancer, got through, and in my 30s, I was pretty healthy, moved to Boulder, started my functional medicine practice here, and was doing pretty well. And right after the Boulder flood in 2013, the next year, I started going downhill again. Oh. And you know where this is going, what happened was my office um, had gotten compromised, the basement, and I was right over a crawl space that was unfinished. So I had actually lots and lots of mold in my office. And over six months to a year, I really, really went downhill and got very ill again. And I had had to find out what was going on to survive again. And I found it, it was mold. And I say that because um, there's a thing with uh, mold, especially mold exposure, but a lot of these chronic infections and toxins, like I said, toxic load, infectious burden, where you're literally like, for example, if you smell in mycotoxins through your nose, they go directly through this little plate called the cribriform plate into the brain and nervous system. And your hypothalamic axis, which is the axis that controls a fight or flight or adrenaline can literally, there's studies, I, I wrote about this briefly in the book that show just the chemical smell of a toxin like mold or some other chemical can trigger a fight or flight response in your body. So even if you're like well-adjusted, you have a wonderful family, you're supported, you've done all your work on you know any trauma, you can literally get traumatized PTSD from smelling a toxic smell. And mold is a really a significant example because number one, it's very traumatic. And there's something really about it that's even more um, triggering than a lot of other chemicals. Like say you smelled, you know, um, ammonia in your farm store, you might not be triggered like you would be with mold, but there's a very real trigger. And when you've been through like your son or yourself, and especially when you've encountered, as we all do, even myself, where doctors kind of look at you like, uh, yeah, you're fine. Labs look okay. You know, and, and that just makes you feel even more like, well, am I imagining this? What I think something's not right. And I just want to tell your listeners, the number one thing I want to tell you with tears in my eyes and such love in my heart, don't ever let anyone tell you that you're not valid in how you feel because you know your body better than anyone else. You know your son better than anyone else. And your concerns are so valid. And to have anyone say, oh, well, everything looks normal. You must be imagining it. Or I can't, or even I can't do anything for you. That almost invalidates 
you as well. And I know we've all heard these things. So find someone that can help you. And the thing you did is probably the most important. I hate that this has to be the way it is, but the more you understand, the more you educate yourself, the more empowered you become because you know this is real. You know there's something you can do. And then you can ask for what you need. Well, I do think that it is essential to be your own advocate or to be the advocate for your loved one because I... I found out that in medical school, most often there's one or two health classes. Mm -hmm. And then there's all this other stuff that they take. And like you said, pharmaceutical companies are needed, yeah. but they are part of, not mm -hmm. the answer to. Right. Right. Um, you have in your book, which I love, two different kinds of buckets. You had mentioned um, the exotoxins and then the endotoxins. So talk to us a little bit about that. I just want to equip our listeners and those who are watching with what kinds of things to look for and not to just say, oh, I've got to take a pill for this, but yeah. I need to investigate. Yeah. So um, just like I said, the two things that are most re relevant, again, uh, toxic load, infectious burden. Now we're going to this toxic load bucket. I always say it's almost like we're born with a bucket. And that bucket is our ability, our, our capacity to detoxify all the stuff we come encounter with through our life, whether it's bad food or poor air quality or toxins in our um, soil or that we breathe in or that we eat or whatever. And so that bucket ability, like I joke, I was born with a really small bucket because <laughs> what happens is as it fills up, maybe your son too, you know, yes. as it fills up, then all of a sudden when it starts to spill, that water level goes over the top, we start to have diseases and symptoms. And like for me at breast cancer at 25, so my bucket got full and all of a sudden my body could not keep up and it started spilling over the top and that can cause um, autoimmunity so things like yeah. lupus rheumatoid arthritis Crohn's colitis um, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis there's any of the itises are probably autoimmune in nature and it's this body attacking self it can cause cancer and like in my case at 25 and it can cause neurodegenerative diseases so brain inflammation yes. autoimmune encephalopathy where there's brain inflammation from infections or even dementia Alzheimer's Parkinson's for the um other generations as well. So all of these things in that bucket, when it gets full, start to spill over and create disease. So then my job as a functional medicine doctor is say, what is in that bucket and how do we lower that load, lower the water level to give you back margin? Because our bodies are created by God to heal and detox. And all we need is a little margin. And then our bodies can pick it up and start to detoxify and we can overcome that illness or even reverse it. And what you mentioned in the book is how I categorize what water is in that bucket, what's in the bucket. And we call it either exo, meaning external or endo meaning internal toxins. So some of the external ones would be heavy metals, parabens, phthalates, um, organophosphates like pesticides in our food, Roundup. Um, it could be mold or mycotoxins. It could be um, charred or burned meats or, or charred or burned foods as our um, hydro compounds. And then on the endotoxins, the inside, we can actually have overgrowth of bacteria in our gut, overgrowth of yeast in our gut, parasites in our gut, and all of these produce toxins internally. And even our hormones, if they're not balanced, can be toxins and medications. So now, again, I'm not against medications. I use, I prescribe all the time for, but they can be, if there's too much or too many of them, an endotoxin as well. Well, one of the things that we learned is that Jonathan was given two medications that he cannot synthesize at all, but took them for 10 years because I didn't know the questions to ask. And that also caused a movement disorder that was irreversible. Now we're working on that because mm -hmm. I don't believe it is irreversible. I think that there are, like you said, the margin in his bucket as mm -hmm. we are detoxifying, we are getting out the bad and getting the good in. Um, one of the questions that I also had is you have a special, specialty with psychoneuroimmunology. I think that is the most amazing word. Now explain to me what that is. So this is so it is because so often in conventional medicine, even we're trained and it doesn't make sense. We have the um, rheumatologist. They just deal with the joints. We have the gastroenterologist. They just deal with the gut. And we have the neurologist. They just deal with the brain and et cetera, et cetera. You can go on and name all the specialties. So if you have an issue that's gut, brain and body, you're going to go to each silo. And they're going to tell you one little thing and one little drug, right? But they're not talking to anybody else. They're not looking at any other thing. And they're not thinking about the body as a whole. Or the so, vagal nervous system. Yeah, <laughs> as yeah, all that it connects. <laughs> and, and that's the aha. Uh -huh, because I think around the time 20 years ago when I was in medical school, it was just started to be talked about, but now even more so. And what this is, psychoneuroimmunology, um, and, and there's endocrine in there too sometimes, it's how the symphony of our neurons and our nervous system and our vagus nerve and our gut and our microbes in our gut and our hormones hormones 
all talk to one another and regulate and co-regulate. So if you have excess estrogen, that could cause a mood imbalance because it affects serotonin. Or if you have a gut microbe overgrowth, like too many bad bacteria or too many yeast, that can speak to the vagus nerve and cause anxiety or insomnia. And yes. these are examples, right? But it's like, it all talks to one another. So it, it's funny. I'll give you a perfect example. When I first started functional medicine, I would have a college kid come in, their mom sent them in and they were depressed, right? So 20 something come in and they're depressed. They'd talk to me, get the history and I'd be like, okay, Joe, um, we're going to need to do a stool test. And, and they would just look at me like, what? <laughs> what does stool have to do with my brain? And what does my and poop I, have to do yeah, with exactly. the fact that I'm depressed? <laughs> exactly. But that, to me, it makes so much sense. And I'd explain because your microbiome controls so many things in your body. And if your microbiome is a balance, which is one way we can stool testing can tell us what's going on in the microbiome. And that has everything to do with mood and sleep and brain and all those things. So that was a funny story, but it's very relevant because they all talk and they all um, relate to one another. How would you instruct us as um, patients and as individuals when, because when I was new to this a year ago, I felt like I was drowning. Yes. All of these new words and new definitions to diseases that I had no idea about. For someone just starting out, what are some of the basics that they can do and that they can research for their loved one or for themselves? Like As caregivers, it's expected that we will mm -hmm. struggle and our life expectancy is compromised because of the stress load because we're on 24-7. Yeah. What are some things that as caregivers we can do to care for ourselves and also to be an advocate for our loved one? Yeah, um, this is so important, but it's literally like a whole new language and a whole new study. Yeah. Like, I'm not ready for this course yet, right? <laughs> so I really do understand the overwhelm. I mean, because I've been in medicine 20 years and um, it's still sometimes there's a lot. So, um, and I remember very specifically, my diagnosis of cancer came as I was third year medical school. So I had quite a bit of education behind me. And I looked at all the treatment options with my doctors for my cancer. And I went to I, the libraries back when you had to actually go to the library versus the internet. Yeah. And I got stacks and stacks of research articles to read. And I remember literally inches and inches of stacks. And I was so overwhelmed by the complexity of deciding what kind of treatment was best. And I had a medical education. So that to say, I really empathize, empathize with those of you who are overwhelmed, because I remember thinking, if I'm in medicine, and this data is so complex and so overwhelming, and I want to cry because I don't know what the right answer is, I can't imagine how the average person is navigating. And it's only gotten exponentially more complex since 20 years ago. So first thing is just compassion. You don't have to know everything. Second thing is, if you want to know where to start, the gut is always a good place because the gut controls everything else. And even like I said, when someone comes in depression, anxiety, insomnia, I start with the gut. And it's somewhat simple in the, in the fact of food is medicine. And so I always say, let's keep it really simple. If you don't take any supplements and start with clean air, 80% of our viral toxic exposures through the air that we breathe. So maybe make sure your house is a good air filter, clean water, clean food. So clean air clean water, clean food. And with clean food, I'd recommend an anti-inflammatory diet. Most people do better with no gluten, no dairy, no sugar or limited sugar and no or limited alcohol. Those are the very basics. If you want to get a little more broad, you can give a, get rid of soy and corn because they're typically commercially processed. We have a lot more sensitivities to those. And even further, sometimes peanuts or eggs, those are kind of the, the, the big ones. And then eating mostly organic whenever possible and non-processed whenever possible. Um, ingredient labels you can actually understand with maybe five ingredients or less. So even though that seems overwhelming, that's a very simple thing. That's probably 80% of the, of the core that you need. And then learning about your gut and learning about, you know, some basics. So if I had like desert island kind of things, I'd say vitamin D is really critical, probably a probiotic of some sort. I'm now on to spore probiotics um, and maybe um, mineral support or fish oil. Those are kind of a few basics, but you don't necessarily have to get super deep and complex. And um, this is one of my passions. I have the podcast and like being on here with you and on the website, like I have so much free data out there for people to read articles and things. And you can find someone like me. I have lots of colleagues that do a great job as well. And you can start to listen to podcasts or you can start to read articles and they're out there. Yeah, they're out there. And yours is amazingly robust. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I found one that said reframing. And I thought, well, that's what I'm going to listen to. But <laughs> but seriously, learning from that. And also, I think you're a part of the mast cell group that you speak with. And that's Jeff Davison. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched a lot of his stuff as well. Who else would you recommend connecting with or 
not connecting with, but listening to, um, seeking out so you can become an educated person. So I love this. Um, a couple websites, these are all nonprofits. And uh, just if someone's looking for a doctor, wants to find more information, um, Institute for Functional Medicine, which is ifm.org. It's where I started and did my certification and training. And they are probably the most well-known organization to train functional medicine doctors. So you can go on there and search by zip code in your area and see if there's someone And they're listed either. I mean, on there is chiropractors, nutritionists, MDs, DOs. So if you want to find an MD, you can look by that uh, criteria, or if you want to find a nutritionist or someone else, but they're all listed there. Um, ISEAI, so it's International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, ISEAI.org. That is an organization that's even another step in the realm of uh, toxicity from mold and Lyme, like really complex, chronic, environmental toxicity kinds of things. Um, and what's interesting is often people will present with MS or neurological issues or these things we talked about, and those are a lot of the root. So that's a whole nother level of training as well. These are all, again, nonprofit. You can find docs that are certified or a part of that organization there. Um, and ILADS is specific for Lyme. If you want a Lyme literate doctor, if you've dealt with tick-borne infections, I-L-A-D-S, um, uh, you can check those. Those are kind of the big ones. There's a few other like uh, anti-aging groups that have docs. Um, you kind of want to talk to the doc or maybe ask the nurse or someone because they're all, just because they're functional medicine trained doesn't necessarily mean some of them do hormones, some of them do, you know, different things. So you kind of want to find someone that fits what you're looking for um, and more and more being trained. But the difficulty is also sometimes you have to travel because there's not always a functional medicine doctor in your area. Well, see, just like I tell Dr. Troy, we just need to clone him. And now we need to clone you <laughs> because your waiting list is over a year long. And that can be so difficult when in caring to have to wait a long time. And yet it is so essential. Like Dr. Jill, when you went through breast cancer and when you depended on Jesus to help with Crohn's and then later going through this, the incredibly stressful experience of a divorce, mm -hmm which I have gone through as well, yeah. that that can actually change our genetic functions. Yeah. Can you just speak into those who are in that place? Yeah. Okay. So this is probably the most amazing part of what I'm going to tell you today, because this can get heavy and this can get so hard. And I know that many of you listening are in the midst of suffering yourselves or a loved one. And there's days you probably wake up and it's maybe a little hard to get out of bed. Maybe it is. Maybe you can't get out of bed. I just want to acknowledge how difficult. And it's funny because I'm thriving and I talk all over the world, really. And I got joy and enthusiasm and I love what I do. But I have had days where I am laying in bed. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do it today. And I want you to know that because it's real. And even those of us who have a story and who God's allowed to overcome, those days where you feel like you can't go are real. The hope that I want to tell you is, though, our mindset, our joy in Christ, our faith, um, all of the things he gives us, like being able to walk in nature, being able to have coffee with a friend. Um, I had two beautiful puppies for 17 years who recently passed, but I had those kinds of joys in our life. Those literally have the ability. I just last weekend was in Seattle with one of the leaders in functional medicine about epigenetics. And the whole entire conference was how our mindset, our nutrition can change gene expression. And if that isn't exciting, I don't know what is, because what that tells us is there's nothing determined that we can't overcome. And part of my story in the book and part of my, my talk here is I believe that we can really overcome almost anything that comes our way. And it may not look like what we think it does. We have to surrender the outcome to God. We have to say, God, I trust you in this but make beauty from ashes. He does it so well. And I over and over and over and now, I mean, if something comes, it's difficult. I just got through a remediation of mold in my kitchen. You would think I would not have to go through this again. And in August, I was really affected again by it. And but again, God just continues to use this. And what I've known now is like, my job is being the guinea pig. He takes me through these experiences and there is no amount of book knowledge that would ever come close to what I've learned in the experience. So if you are in the midst of suffering, first of all, I'm sorry. And I love you. And I'm so sorry you have to suffer. But second of all, there is so much hope. Number one, that you can restore health and healing to you or your loved one. Number two, that you can actually change your gene expression. Like that's amazing. And number three, that God has a plan for his glory in the midst of the most suffering. That's where he is closest. And we all know this if we've suffered. Like I remember my cancer days and 
I think I've been just as close to my God since then. But those days, I was so close. And I sometimes miss that communion that we have in the suffering. Um, so I hope that's hopeful. But I really believe in the power of overcoming and the power of our ability to, with God's help, to, to really reverse things that are considered irreversible. One of my questions that I think is the hardest is in caring for a child who is cognitively challenged with um, intellectual developmental disability. I can't think for him. And so he will ruminate, ruminate, ruminate. And I know neural pathways can be changed, that declarations make a difference, that writing things down, that speaking things make a difference, that right left brain activity makes a difference. For those who have the cognitive decline, what are some possible things to help with their mindset? Oh, this is so good. So I would say on that realm, I, when I think about, so limbic retraining is something I talk a lot about, and it's one of the first steps in order to heal from chronic and complex illness. And what that means is our limbic system, like I mentioned before, is our fight or flight system. It's the amygdala. And that part of our brain senses threat or danger, and it can be chemical, it can be uh, environmental, it can be threat, like actual trauma. Um, and our body's like, oh my gosh, this is dangerous. We need to either run or we need to freeze. Or we need to, you know, do something else. There's a couple of different things are fawn or freeze or, or flight or whatever. Anyway, bottom line is that limbic system with illness can get activated. Yeah. Um, and ways that we can do that are either active, like you take a course, you do a, a limbic retraining thing, there's things like that. But someone like your son may not be able to engage as easily. And what I was going to say for someone like that, there's passive ways. Okay. So these are the kind of things that I would suggest. One would be like biurnal beats. It's a type of music. That yes, just I just listened and, to that the other day. Yeah. And you can take classics or hymns or whatever music you like and find it in that realm because all it is is a slightly different frequency that triggers your brain to calm. So it's like this wonderful calming. Um, another one is the thing I have laying on my floor right there that that's called that's a yes. piece. Like Matt, um, yeah. you can get all kinds and all all different w ways to do that. But I love that because that is it's a pulsed electromagnetic frequency, and that actually has the ability to change your brain waves and and be calming. When I first started using that at night, I'm a good sleeper, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But I noticed my deep sleep went up by probably thirty percent as far as how deep and how much I got with that mat. So yeah. something like EMF could actually change the frequency of the body and help healing and help sleep. And then uh, cranial sacral therapy. I'm sure you're familiar. Yes. He's doing that. that. Yeah. So that's a wonderful one, a hands on, very gentle, very subtle, very powerful for the limbic system. Um, and so let's see, biurnal beats, uh, limbic retraining. Um, and then some of the stuff you've done with therapists like limbic retraining um, in this realm of EMDR, this um, yeah, we've done that. Thought therapy, uh, brain spotting, um, even neuro linguistic. And some of that depends on the um, you know ability of the per person to participate. But there are quite a few passive things and even simple things like Epsom salt baths. Yes, we do that. Life. Yes. Or, yeah. So, yep. so those are the kind of things that I would do. And interesting, you mentioned kind of the uh, rumination, which is in the category of obsessive compulsive. And that can actually be completely from an infection too. As you know, a lot of times the pan and pandas, which is the inflammation of the brain will cause um, this loops called limbic loops, right? And they'll get stuck in this rumination and they can't get out. And then I'm sure, you know, you know redirecting and those things, um, probiotics can be helpful there too. We also use an infrared light. Oh, and we actually got a, yes, we got a dome. I'm like, that is my medicine every night to lay in that and just sweat and yes. and know that it's healing my body as well as um, causing a sense of relaxation as a nighttime routine and therapy. Dr. Jill, I, I could talk to you for days and days. <laughs> and I know you don't have days and days. But as we wrap up, I just want to thank you for speaking into this area of our body, our soul, our mind, and our spirit, because you've mentioned so much on body, but you've also mentioned our mind mm -hmm. and our spirit and to allow the Holy Spirit to move in us as we learn and grow and change. What are some final words that you want to say to those who don't know where to begin or this is all new information and they're like, there is hope. Yeah. That right there is the crux and the core. If I can bring someone listening the knowledge that there is more out there, that there might be answers. I'll just tell you when I was told Crohn's is incurable, you're going to have this forever. There's diet has nothing to do with it. And, and I'll tell you what's important here. I didn't know much as a medical student at that time. I had no nutritional training. I did not have a background to say you're wrong, right? I didn't know. And so you as a patient may feel like disempowered because you don't really know for sure what's true and what's not. But what I want to tell you is God invited in each of us our intuitive sense, which is really the Holy Spirit, right? 
And that intuition is what has guided me so often. And again, it's his spirit, but we can call it intuition. We can call it whatever we call it. It's that, that knowing in our heart. So I grew up in a bioengineering kind of family. I did bioengineering for my undergrad degree, very, very analytical German Swiss kind of roots. And I lived in my head for most of my life. So it'd be very logical. And what I want to give your listeners is go to the heart space where God lies and where God gives you wisdom, because that's where you're going to have the sense of like, wait, this doctor doesn't feel quite right to me. I need yes. to find someone else. Or this answer doesn't feel quite right. Trust that heart, that intuition, that spirit inside of you, because that is truly where the best wisdom comes from. And you're going to hear the voices around you telling you different. And you're going to maybe question yourself. But if you go back to that heart space, truth lies there. And that's where hope lies. And that's where God's spirit within us lies. And that's where I found most of my healing and answers when I was in the darkest times. Dr. Jill, thank you so much for speaking into that. That is so vital because we do, especially in our society today, can stay so cerebral, but it's in the heart that overflows the springs of life, as Proverbs yes. says. Yes. Where can people find you besides drjill.com? <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, so um, jillcarnia.com is where I have all the free resources and stuff. Um, and if you want to get your copy of the book that you, we've been talking about, it's readunexpected.com. And I just, I can't wait. My prayer is that it will touch and change lives and inspire people to have. What I did is put lots of resources in there so yes. that if you're trying to learn, that's a great place to start. But thank you for asking. Oh, it was a, it's an amazing book and it is already published or it's about to be published. It is published in 2023. So you That's can pre-order now or you can get it next year. Yeah. And the, and the tips and the hints and the like things to ask for are so practical. Thank you for the time that you spent putting that, putting that on paper for people like me who don't have the education or knowledge that you have and that you've trained for and that God has kind of squeezed you into as a result of what he's allowed for you. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me.